This is Star Talk Sports Edition. Let me bring on my co-host, Gary O'Reilly. Gary, how you doing, hey, man? Hey, Neil. All right. Former soccer pro from the UK mm -hmm. and now retired and uh, yes. serving as... Uh, but our part-time announcer, but you announce other, you actually still announce soccer games, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I get to pollute the airwaves um, <laughs> okay. and, and tell, tell people who are much younger than me what they're doing wrong and, and sometimes what they're doing right. So it's there you go. There you go. And Chuck, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. I do the same thing as Gary, except without sports attached. <laughs> okay. I just tell young people what they're doing wrong and why uh, they suck. Uh, <laughs> so Gary, what did you cook up? You and your producers uh, cook up for today. All right. Um, we recently, or you recently, did an explainer. How fast can a car accelerate? Um, and it triggered a lot of interest, and and you know, Ooh. real amount of interest. And our audience. This is our were, this is our spinoff. Just the ten minute explainer. Yeah, ten fifteen minute explainer. And yeah. it's been it's been phenomenally successful. But this one really did sort of grab a, a certain audience. Mm -hmm. And they they were asking, you know, get someone from Formula One on, get someone from NASCAR on. We want to know everything that's going on. Talk, 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 talk. And um, well, FYI to all of our audience, we're working on that. So okay. hopefully <laughs> we'll have both those boxes ticked in the coming months. So mm -hmm. uh, stand by, be ready. Um, while we wait for those to drop, um, you know, pop the hood. Uh, take a look inside and find out how and why cars are doing not to 60 in under three seconds, which is bonkers for me growing up with things that did it in nine. Wait, for more. Americans, not means zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, sorry. Yes, not, zero to 60. Zero. But, but first, I mean, I suppose really in the classic sense, we need someone to come along and kick the tires. So we found that person, and that person is Jason Fenske. Now, if I've pronounced that correctly, congratulations me. If I haven't, my apologies, Jason. <laughs> Uh, you did great. He's a Thanks, Gary. Yeah, I did great. Yay. <laughs> um, English isn't my first. Oh, yes, it is my first language. Yes. Um, he, he's a mechanical engineer. He's a YouTube car guru. I'll, I'll, I'll explain it that way. And he is founder, owner, and host of the Engineering Explained channel on YouTube. And this channel is so popular. It's got a three and a half million subscribers and has been on the air for about the last 12 years. So, uh, Neil. Ooh. Well, wait, so, so that's not even what's impressive, okay? Mm -hmm. Three and a half million, so what? The total number exactly. of views to all of his videos is yeah. more than 600 million. So yes. we're, we're talking serious, serious access into yeah. people's gearhead ways in, in the world. Yeah, so but most, of that, like most of that was one guy without a life. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck <laughs> speaks the truth. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. What I like here was the introduction of the audience wanted someone from Formula One. So we reached to the bottom of the barrel and found this guy. On the oh, we found an engineer. Oh, found oh. an engineer. No, yeah. we've, got, we've got these things in the pipeline, Jason. So we yeah, couldn't gonna keep our audience waiting any longer. So yes. we had to I, I don't think that, I think his point was, um, your intro sucked. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, no, I, I think, think it's put me in my deserved place. <laughs> no, oh, no, oh, no, we're joking. All right, so so here's the thing. I put out a, a, a what we call an explainer video, which is random stuff in our civilization that I think could benefit from highlighting the physics that's going on in it. And one of them was, you know, what's the maximum uh, a car can accelerate under sort of normal conditions? And when you do that with sort of a, a frictional coefficient of one, and a, which is rubber on concrete or, or asphalt, which is a very high friction level there, you come up with more than three seconds, but not much more. And yet we realize that there's some cars that are doing better than that. And the only way I understand that from my physics background is that the car is somehow attaching itself to the road and going beyond the coefficient of friction of one, maybe getting more than one as a coefficient of friction, as from a dead stop uh, zero to mm. 60 acceleration. So we're trying to find out here from you, yes. is that right? Were my calculations correct? And what is the future of this sort of acceleration crown that is currently owned by our, my record show here, a Tesla 2021 S? 2.06 yeah, Model seconds. S, I think, is current fastest. And I like your calculation methodology here. I think it's very cool. And yes, if you look at like, okay, if you have one G, if you have one gravity pulling down on that car, that's your max Excel, right? 
Up, um, up, up so over three seconds. You, right, right. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so that gives you like something like 2.7 seconds, I believe it is, mm-hmm. uh, as your like theoretical limit. And yet we know it's possible to beat that, not only because it's done, but like you can look at a car and say, okay, we have cars that have decelerated from 60 miles per hour to zero in less than 100 feet. And so that means the average acceleration or deceleration in this case is greater than 1G. They're they're doing what seems impossible. So what what you describe is correct in that the wait, wait, tires... You, that, wait, that can happen if you crash into a wall. Yeah, I was going to no, say. It really can fast. happen if you crash is into a wall. We, is that how we quicker. worked it out? <laughs> but we're doing, this, we're doing this purely with tires. This, this, oh, uh, oh, oh, okay. okay. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Slow down with tires. All right, gotcha, gotcha. Yes. All right. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you, the reverse is true also, right? Like you can put a rocket on the back of a car and then you're no longer limited by tires in your acceleration. Correct. Uh, but correct. as far as mm-hmm. street legal tires, our, our today's limit is about two seconds. Um, car companies have said they beat that. Uh, they're lying because there's this old industry standard of how we test zero to 60 that actually starts at like six miles per hour. So it's nonsense. So you get oh, a, that you're right. really getting a rolling start. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. Mm-hmm. That's what it's called. It's called rollout. And you get everyone deletes the first foot and says the first foot doesn't count. Uh, and the first foot should count if it's a zero to 60. Yeah. If it's a six to 60. All right, fine. Um, yeah, but, yeah, plus, the, plus, Jason, the, your timings here are to the hundredth of a second. So these things matter. Yes. Right? This yes. Tesla exactly. we have at 2.06 seconds, the Ferrari, uh, Le Ferrari SF90. At 2.1 seconds, the Porsche 911 Turbo S lightweight, 2.24 seconds. So, yep. and, that's, and likely uh, these numbers you're seeing are with rollout deducted. So, the real number would be about 0.2 to 0.3 seconds longer than what those numbers say. Um, so, right. for example, when this Tesla got the record and they said it was like 1.99 seconds, the actual time was like 2.3 seconds. Mm. And they were like, we broke two seconds. And it's like, that is, didn't, but it's cool. It's still I, cool. I, I, I just got to tell you that that's kind of like an a-hole Elon Musk Here thing comes an do. Elon joke. Okay. Yeah, I feel it coming. Go on. Get it out oh, of your no, system, that, Chuck. No, that was it. I'm just saying. That Get just it out of your so, system. Seems so very Elon. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, He's not the okay. old, in his defense. No, not that no, he I know, it's defense, a, I know it's the standard a lot in the of, industry. Yes, exactly. I know, I Porsche know. doesn't do it. So props to Porsche. Like, we nice. can direct positive... Uh, vibes towards porsche for doing it right okay. wait, wait wait stop stop the presses <laughs> who started calling it porsche when i grew up it was uh, porsche i, I think it was porsche. <laughs> no no it was a black girl <laughs> in chicago no, no, porsche no. <laughs> porsche uh, porsche <laughs> porsche is a shakespearean character oh, yeah, well, it's, it's, porsche. it's train yes. When your audience is car enthusiasts, you get berated anytime you say anything just slightly incorrect. So Mm -hmm. I have been trained to say Porsche because I guess that's how they say it in Germany. And uh, so, so yeah, that's how I'll continue to say it. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. right. Now, how mad, how mad was Ferrari that Tesla (laughs) beat them in a zero to 60? That's got to piss them off. Oh. Yeah, and it's interesting too because it's like you can spend three million dollars on a car, or you can spend a hundred thousand dollars on a car, and they both hit sixty in the same amount of time. Like, that's a bummer, right? Like, that's how right. electric cars have really brought uh, the the price right. disparity down from performance. Well, just cars. I didn't I didn't make that announcement. So of course the Tesla is electric, Looks right. the Ferrari is hybrid, and the Porsche was in internal combustion. So it, we're actually comparing three different kinds yeah. of motors here. Right. Okay. Yes. All right. So, Jason, how do you, what do, you, how are you cheating to beat the the acceleration of one G? What are you doing to arrive at that? Yeah. So, I think it's a it's a it's an interesting question, and it's like it's difficult. I don't know. I guess it's a good answer, but if you think about like how does a tire work, like how does a gear work, for example, a gear works by by meshing within a groove, and you can push against that, right? And a tire works in a similar way where it meshes into the road. So it can push laterally against the road, uh, whether that's for decelerating, accelerating, cornering, whatever. So you can exceed, you know, that 1G if you were to just assume a perfectly smooth surface, one sitting on the other. That's how I, I see, at no, least no, no, internally. No, no, you can't. I don't, I don't see how you can exceed 1G if it's one smooth rubber on any other smooth surface, unless it's gummy 
and it's sticking. So, so, so in other well, words, if you had a textured surface, then like, yes. you, like you said, the gears, then the rubber can dig into the texture yes. and then push yes. off of it the way gears would. And then you're not limited to the friction at that point. Mm. Okay. But when you, when you want that texture to be on the road and not on the tire? Correct. Because if the yes. tire is completely flat and the road is textured, then you get the road digging into the tire. Mm. But if the tire is yes. textured and the road is flat or even textured, you don't get as much uh, grabbing. I don't think it matters. Okay. As long as one intersects the other, right? But yep. Jason, that's why we have you here. Talk, Jason. Exactly. But like, so the, the rubber is soft, right? The road is hard. Right. So the rubber is the one that kind of goes into the grooves of the road. So the rubber is a, the road is very rough surface. You have, you know, softer rubber gives you a better lot. And so you have that rubber sink into the road and then, you know, it propels you forward like a, like a gear could. If it was a gear sitting on, you know, a, a, like a pinion, um, Right. Rack and pinion type system where the wheel is, you know, the pinion and the rack is on the ground, and then you accelerate using that gear, just using rubber instead of a gear and and that rack. So the best uh, case scenario would be to go zero to sixty on tires made of chewing gum. No, <laughs> <laughs> which flavor? <laughs> oh, it's got to be bubblicious. It's got to be. Oh, yeah. okay, fine. Yeah. Well, so, right, yeah. wait, 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 Jason. So the. Sorry, Gary, I got to get this out. So, so are they doing this on the same track? Mm. And does yeah, that so track have nicks and dings in it? And are they using the same rubber tires? Because if none of those are the same, then we're not comparing which correct. car can accelerate. Apples. We're not correct, really doing correct. this. It's, it's all silly. It's all for hubris, right? Like, that's why we do these comparisons. Um, Chuck is kind of right about the chewing gum thing and that in drag races... They will actually like spray down essentially glue so that when you launch, your tire is sitting on this glue right at the very start. So you get a really good start. Um, so that is done. And that is the way that Tesla says that they got their 1.98 second or whatever it was. And so it's like, okay, it was done on a drag strip. You deleted some time and you used glue. It's like, so once you put all these into like context, it's like, right. well, you can just take a drag tire, yeah. which is much more capable than street tires, and you can beat two seconds all day long. And then so they, right. forgot, Elon, to Elon they forgot to become... mention they also used the Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're discussing here. That was the final here, thing we did. Yeah. All right. Elon Musk has become dick dastardly out of wacky races, right? So there's nothing he can't do, he won't do to cheat. Well, I don't understand that sentence. Say that Did again? you know they see the animation Wacky Races? Wacky Races. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Dick, okay. Dick Dastardly. Dick Dastardly. Yeah. Dick okay. Dastardly with Sorry, the double I was out of that one. Okay, go no, on. No, no, that's fine. You were too busy being scientific. The okay. Rest of us were wasting <laughs> our time in front of the TV, obviously. So, okay, Jason. Before we get to the rubber on the t on the surface, sure. what what between a, an electric motor and an inter internal combustion engine is different that makes this thing go? put so much power and energy in there that they can do this sort of speed. So what's the difference really there? What's going on? Fundamentally, there's a different energy source, right? Like a battery versus a fuel tank. But as far mm. as how they accelerate, I think there's, there's two key differences between a combustion engine and an electric motor. The electric motor, uh, in how they behave, I should state. Yeah. So the electric motor is going to have torque immediately. So uh, it, it oh. starts out, its torque curve at zero is basically peak torque, and it remains that way until you're limited in power. So you get all of your torque immediately, right at the beginning when the car isn't moving. A combustion engine requires a certain RPM, so it has to rev up to a certain RPM in order to reach that peak torque. So you, you have a delay there in when uh, not only when you are able to reach your maximum acceleration, but also to delay in when you ask for it versus when you receive it. So that's the second difference being the response of an electric motor. Hey, I want these electrons to move. They do that very quickly. The response of a combustion engine, I want this air that's in an intake to then go into a cylinder, get pulled down, get compressed, explode. You're asking for that to happen. And of course that can't be an instant process. So as far as response, when Wait, you press and then on the it's got to turn the piston, which goes to the crankshaft, the which crank goes to the thing, which goes right. to the wheel. All that's got to exactly. happen. Exactly. Yes, right. it's a long process. So when you press that pedal down, whichever go pedal it is, gas or electric, uh, the electric one is going to respond so much quicker than the gas one because so many more things have to happen for that combustion uh, to start happening and to react to what you asked it to do. One thing electricity is really good at is rotating things. <laughs> So that's, that's, you know, that's what turbines are. That's what just rotate. 
That's all it wants to do, and that's what it does best. So where it's gasoline, you got to, like, you need your Rube Goldberg device to end up turning your wheels at the end of that, yes. uh, end of that path. Right. Yeah, we right. use so reciprocating to motion to create circular motion with combustion mm -hmm. engines versus circular motion to create circular motion with electric motors. Exactly. But Perfectly worded. The, Perfectly worded. The rotary engine does exist, and ah, Mazda did just bring it back Mazda in Europe. Commercial. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which, which so, by the way, no one bought into. Like, not the I way remember they that. thought. They were like, it's a rotary engine. And America was like, so what? Well, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> well, so describe, tell us about the Wankel engine. Well, uh, the, one of the big flaws is that it burns oil by design. So you actually inject oil into the combustion chamber where this rotary is spinning. Um, but it's very different in that a traditional engine, you have a piston that moves up and down. Uh, you mm -hmm. have four strokes and that gives you your combustion process. You still have these four cycles in a rotary engine, intake, compression, power, exhaust. But it's all done with this little Dorito that okay. spins inside of a housing. And so it has <laughs> rotational motion from oh, the start. No. So it's a three-sided rotating yeah. thing, a Dorito. Yeah. Right? Is it three yeah. sided? Mentioned, that. You mentioned yeah. food. That's it. Chuck's going to be gone for a while now. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, his yeah. Mind, his never, mind's going to wander. I now he's interested like, in I, it again. I never knew I liked rotary engines until just <laughs> now. <laughs> okay, I have to give a geopolitical historical fact here, if I may. Uh -huh. This is a, a public service announcement. Uh, the Wankel engine, I remember when Mazda introduced it, the big selling point was, a big selling point, was that it had one-third or two-thirds fewer parts, fewer moving parts yes. than a regular engine, which meant it would not break down as often. Mm. And in a world where cars <laughs> broke down, this was a highly desired feature. Right. That was before cars, even internal combustion engine cars, were so reliable that no one is worried in the morning. But Jason, I don't know how old you are, but I'm old enough to remember, there was a chance every morning that your car might not start. There yes. was a chance, okay? And you did not always know if you'd get to work on time in your own car. So this was a selling point at a time when car engines basically failed. Cars would be on the side of the road with the hood open. That doesn't happen anymore. So. If, if that's uh, no longer a selling point, why would anyone want a Wankel engine? That's my question back to you, Jason. Oh, okay. Well, um, I think like uh, the enthusiast spirit is probably the, the real answer of like why someone might want it today. Unfortunately, they brought it back as a range extender. So I don't think that's what people were looking for. Okay, but more um, miles per gallon. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. So basically just to generate electricity. Uh, okay. The advantage Mazda sends is its size. So they're very compact because you have three chambers where combustion uh, is basically this this four stroke cycle is occurring in three separate places at any given time whereas in a you know a piston cylinder engine if you have one cylinder you have one place where that's happening so you can have really good power density meaning the the engine can be very small and compact that's its biggest advantage um it has emission emissions disadvantages up until this point maybe Mazda has uh, created some tricks for the one that's coming out uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, there there aren't there aren't a, there aren't huge upsides to it returning other than it's cool. You uh, lost me at wanker. That's the problem. You know what? That, what? <laughs> There's an L on the end there. <laughs> wankle, wankle. In oh, there. Never, oh, never oh. let the truth get in the way of a game. That's different. <laughs> My guys, got some mottos. We got to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, we're gonna talk to Jason about is there anything that's limiting the top speed of cars? at all when we come back with our special guest jason fenske on star talk sports edition we're back star talk sports edition today we are not up in the hood we are <laughs> under the hood <laughs> hey <laughs> oh, caught me by surprise on that I one i gotta tell the truth i don't know truth. okay so we we're we're up under the hood uh with jason fenske and jason you have a whole platform uh, engineering explain. Could you just give us a yes. minute? Tell us what that is. Sure. So the idea started back when I was in college um, about 12 years ago. And I majoring wanted to in this, majoring in mechanical engineering. There you go. I thought go I, for it. I thought I might actually learn something about cars uh, while I was getting this major. And I didn't. I just did a bunch of math problems. So that was kind of disappointing. So I created this platform, which was basically taking the intimidation out of cars um, from an engineering standpoint. They're, they're very complicated. So the platform essentially 
is how do cars work from an engineering standpoint uh, in a bunch of videos, um, just kind of breaking it down to bite size, uh, digestible pieces of information. I love it. I love it. A very popular uh, YouTube destination with like a zillion viewers uh views of all of the uh, all of the videos we're not at a billion yet so i don't think i can say a zillion but it would be cool okay to well, a, billion. Ah, ah. <laughs> a zillion is just some number bigger than you remembered to say but yeah when right. you get a when you hit a billion come back here we'll teach you how to say the word yeah great <laughs> all right so so jason tell tell us what uh wait i don't think you answered me from the first segment oh, um i do that is there some feature of the track or was it glue they sprayed on the tires only for that two second acceleration compar comparison? Um, where all three cars, the, the Tesla, the Ferrari, and the uh, Porsche were coming in at around two seconds. Mm. Why don't they just, why don't they just dig grooves? Why don't they just dig grooves into the track? Well, that just, would be a train. Yeah. That would just make it a train. <laughs> so like the the big companies that do this testing, aside from, you know, the the, the brands themselves, like Car and Driver Motor Trend, the big names in, in doing mm. these tests, they do things consistently. So they have their one track that they do it at. They apply atmospheric weather corrections to their numbers. Um, they so there is a there is a standard in place so that you can say this is fair to compare these two. You're on different tires. So that alone, like, means they're going to have differences, right? Uh, it's whatever yeah. tire the t car company chose to put on them. Yeah. Um, and some some companies will be, you know, a little mischievous here and say, like, we offer this tire um, and it, as, the, like, the sports package so they can get these good numbers. And then, realistically, they want you to get a different tire or something like that. Right, right. Um, a, but, a more, a more road-friendly tire for, for your life. But, yeah, I think right. for – in the example with Tesla, they picked the track where they said it had to be done at. They said it needed to use this glue – they wouldn't let Motor Trend do it at their own facility until later Motor Trend argued enough, and then eventually they let them do it. Um, yeah, and then they got different numbers, and that's where the, the real number of 2.3 comes from. Okay, so we all know, or you may have paid attention, uh, it started maybe 15 years ago on off-ramps that have a sharp curve. Mm -hmm. There are grooves in the road that enable the car, to, that prevent the car from sliding off into the railing on the outer edge of that turn. And those grooves came from NASA when they wanted to make sure the space shuttle, when it landed, because it doesn't, it's, it lands with no engine, right? So it's just parachutes and some brakes. So it, it can't reverse the thrust of the engine to slow down. So space shuttle runways are very long. They wanted to make sure that the shuttle wouldn't drift from crosswinds or anything. So they grooved it. Upon learning how effective that was, that became part of our road design for wow. exits that where you're coming from high speed and you have to get to low speed. My question to you, Jason, is- I thought it was uh -oh. just lazy road I didn't even know this, but now I'm gonna get a road. question about it. Yeah, so now, now just check it out. And, and somewhere there's been a risk from before, there are these grooves. So the rubber cannot slide sideways against it easily, all right? You will not skid sideways. Uh, when you have grooves, because the rubber is digging in, just like you said earlier, Jason, with the gearing. My yes. question to you is, if you make a speed track where those grooves are now sideways to you, okay? They're mm. not in the direction you're going, they're at right angles. Now the yes. tire can dig in like grooves of a, of, a, of a gear, and now you could, sky's the limit in the acceleration, it would seem to You're me. right. You're right. I think that would work. I didn't know about the grooves thing. I had always thought it was just a wear thing because I guess some vehicles have different track widths. Um, so it would be difficult to say this is the set groove for everyone. Uh, but you're, right. you're absolutely right about the tire thing. And in fact, um, in off-road tires, so with, with most tires that, that are come on our cars, the tread is all basically on the outside of that tire, the part that touches the ground. On off-road tires, you'll see that tread come down on the oh, sidewalls. On the sidewall. And mm. so the reason for oh, that God. is because off-road, you may be coming up to a rock. And so, you know, that rock has, let's say, a 90-degree angle. You want to use all the grip you have. So you'll use both contact surfaces, whether it's the right side of the tire or beneath the tire, to climb I up. I never it. thought so about that. You can do that. something very similar with grooves in a track. Okay. That's just, which is why it was just a straight those, line. When you look at those YouTube videos, you, it looks like these these off road trucks are Spider Man. They're literally climbing up rocks. Right, it's so right. Weird. My sister has a car that can do that. Right. It's, it's each each wheel can be independently 
not only suspend it as just that's easy, but they can also turn differently. I mean, it's 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 yeah. Crazy. They all have steering. Individual. They all steering have steering. Right. It's like yeah. the thing. Yeah. Is, yeah. It is alive. You know. <laughs> it's trying. Wow. All right. So that Jason, is... I'm finally rested on the acceleration <laughs> questions. So now let me ask you. Um, why are how come no one's going 300 miles an hour on a racetrack? What's going on there? Have we not? Yet. So, um, I guess maybe we haven't. I think there's a, a few car companies that have products that say it can be done. Um, I thought I don't Bugatti know. hit 300. Yeah, I think I think Bugatti did he, hit 300. I don't want to say things. And yeah, it's going to look poorly now, no matter what, because I don't know. Uh, but I think Bugatti did do it. They they have the capability. Uh, there's a few other cars out there that are capable. And essentially, it's a power question um, uh, and not a tire question, which is kind of fun. You're you're mm. limited by aerodynamic drag. So however much power you put in your car and however small you make it, the smaller you make it, the less drag it's going to have. The more aerodynamic you make it, uh, the less drag it's going to have. And, and then and the more us, power you give it. Tell us how drag scales with velocity, with speed. So the force of drag is uh, the equation has velocity squared in it. Power is force times velocity, so power is velocity cubed. Uh, so when it comes to aerodynamic drag, the force coming against you uh, is increasing with a squared exponent uh, as you reach higher speeds. So it's very difficult to overcome. You need a lot more power each time you want to go a little bit faster. Yeah, so, so in other words, so the air resistance against you is significant at high speeds and practically ignorable at low speeds. Is that a fair statement there? Yes, yes, exactly. So in like with zero to 60 times, um, one thing that you can use to help in acceleration is downforce, but you don't have that uh, at low speeds because you don't really have much aerodynamic drag. There's nothing helping to push your car down on the ground because mm. you could use downforce to theoretically have greater acceleration. If you mm -hmm. have a big force pushing your car down, then that means the amount of grip you have is greater and thus you can accelerate faster. Right. Is it is it cheating to draft a car uh, uh, above that's above the speed? Oh, uh, I don't I don't think they allow it as far as like if you say you got the record and you were just you know behind a seven forty seven. By the way, I I told you I told I said this story in one other episode. I'm going to say it again. Uh, I had a car where you could see what your instantaneous miles per gallon was. All right. Yes. I, all cars can do that, right? Most today can. So I was always fascinated by that. What was my miles per gallon as I went uphill? What was it as I was going horizontal? Yes. I was downhill, obviously. The miles per gallon goes up very high. And I said, let me try something. And I took the car and I drove, I would say dangerously close, I don't recommend this at home, hmm. to an 18-wheeler truck. And as I got closer and closer, I'm on a level road now, and I was getting 24 miles per gallon, which was the advertised yep. sort of highway uh, uh, mileage for this car. As I got closer, it then said 28 miles per gallon, 30, 35, 50, 100, infinity. It could not, <laughs> I, when I was within 12 feet of the, of the back door of the, of the car, the, the, you created I, I, a perpetual motion machine I, in that moment. I was like, holy <laughs> shit. I'm, I'm using no energy right now, but now I can't just, you know, text my friend to tell them that because I'll die if the truck stops short. But it was, uh, that drafting is, is something. I mean, that's very real phenomenon. Yes. You know, uh, a similar comparison, if you think about wake surfing, so a, a boat mm -hmm. is going along and you're surfing the wake of that boat. You're using no energy, right? You're not using anything to propel you. You're using the energy of the vehicle in front of you. So that truck can have a wake behind it of this like suction because it's punching this giant hole in the air and then it's creating this suction behind it. Perhaps some of that suction could even be pulling you, uh, meaning, yeah, your your energy use could be, could be zero uh, if you had the perfect design. And I would add that many people don't get this right, and you probably see this, Jason, that when you draft off of someone else, you make them more efficient. You're not, yes, exactly. They, they say, get off win. my back. I don't want to drag you. No, you're not. No, you're not. I'm making you more aerodynamic by coming behind yep. and disrupting the vacuum right. that would otherwise be pulling you backwards. This is the geese flying thing, isn't it? Tailgating, yeah. I think what we're going to do right now is create a dangerous uh, precedent <laughs> yes. for drivers to just like, screw that. Gas <laughs> is hot. Meal, oh, yeah. Gas Meal is says hot. Oh, a gallon. <laughs> right. 
Okay, Thank Jason, you. go back to the the electric vehicles for the time being. I mean, we've seen it on in combustion engine. Man went, I need to make this thing go faster, invented the, tur the turbo. Is there such a thing that you can bring into an electric motor that has a similar effect? Because if we're talking about cars that go fast, we are looking mainly at electric vehicles now. Well, no, know, yeah. wait, don't confuse acceleration yeah. with top so, speed. So acceleration, but things, now we right. need to top. Now we need to get a top speed up for for these sort of things. Are we? Do you? Is there an equivalent for the turbo? I for like an this question. Uh, yeah. And and my initial thought about it is no, but but. There, there's still kind of a way, right? Like, um, the, the question is, can you get more power out of out of a motor? Mm -hmm. uh, and and you can with electric motors, just like you can with uh, you know combustion engines. Um, it, it's simply a matter of heat, and, and eventually that heat means the device fails, whether it's a combustion engine or an electric motor. I think the, the answer to your question, as it relates to electric cars, is a bigger battery, because basically what happens with batteries is that there is a certain discharge rate which we say is acceptable whatever that may mm. be uh and so if you have a small battery on a per cell basis that one individual cell there's a maximum limit of power that can go out of it so if you have more cells that means there's a greater maximum power so simply right. the size of the battery here so that is why we well, see just, all just, these to records interject. today it is yes. it is literally what a battery the word battery means it's like a series of these cells right when you say i have yes. a battery of armor it's it's a so that is the we think of battery yes. as a, as a mm. duracell right but it is literally the sequence of these cells go on i have to slip that in there yes. go ahead yes no that's mm -hmm. very fair so the more of these you have which is why you see cars like you know the tesla or the porsche Taycan or the lucid air uh hitting these records it's because they have massive battery packs you won't see a small battery vehicle hitting these giant numbers. And the reason is the battery is too small, so it doesn't have as much power to discharge. Um, so it's it's very different from like a fuel tank because no one goes, oh, the size of my fuel tank is huge. Like no one cares, whatever you can drive far, cool. That doesn't impact how much power you can make. How much power you can make is impacted by how quickly you can put that fuel into your engine. But Versus Jason, we're talking, car, now, we're, now we're jacking the weight yes. up. Now, now, I know, now, I know. Oh, there's not now a the lesson there. becomes a, a curse. Carry. He's getting there. Go. Okay. Well, it's I'll disappointing. It's, it is. <laughs> it's disappointing <laughs> because there's not this small single device like a turbo that you throw in mm. and, you know, suddenly you're making 50% more power. It's like right. you can you can tune uh, the, the battery to, to go to a higher discharge rate and you can put more power in your motor. It doesn't mean that will be reliable. It doesn't mean your things will last as long, uh, but it can be done um, above like, you know, there's there's limits uh, that we say this is safe. And it will last us two hundred thousand miles. Wait, 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 no, no. no. I got to bring cars. Gary's question back in. And yeah. So the point yeah. is, what you're saying is, I can go faster. All other things being equal, if I have a bigger battery, because then I have more energy yes. to draw from. However, yes. however, now I'm going really fast, but I'm in the in the in a very high air resistance regime. A. Yes. B. The mass of the car is huge now. Yes. Is, is there some plateau? where there's no faster speed an electric car can go because the, ba the battery have to be too damn large? That's a great question. I don't know what the limit would be, but but I mean, I think it would be quite high because you can just think about something that's very long and narrow, right? Like a train, like if, if you have the space to do it, uh, I think putting practical limits on that question could make it fun. If you have the space to do it, like there's so much energy you can put in a battery and you, you can make it really long and and so you could have this absurd number that could happen, but like that would happen on city streets, uh, you know, within a mile of distance. Yeah, then it becomes a much more fun question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is this yeah. a challenge now for car designers? For or unless it's battery designers in in that well, are separate from the car designers I'm, themselves. I mean, not really, because think about it right now. I mean, what's the top speed on these electric cars? It's yeah, like it's a buck whatever yeah, 80. you know yeah, and, yeah. And, like how much more do you want to i mean how much faster do you really want a car to go Chuck, and, how many people you think are asking who, that question right now <laughs> uh, i want who, this who, thing who, to go who, faster what 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 municipality what government is going to say oh yeah bring your bring your 300 mile an hour you know uh, <laughs> electric car <laughs> mass produce that and put it on the street no, Ger no germany no government germany is for one the autobahn, autobahn, the 
Okay. The left lane. Okay. Of the the you got me. I forgot about I the Autobahn. That's fine. That's yes, fine. but let's be honest. They are Germans. They're very restricted people. Okay? <laughs> let's be clear. They're the only people on earth that you can give no speed limit, and they actually respect the fact that there's no speed limit. <laughs> I mean, okay, I so I think now. Chuck raises an excellent point, though, in yeah. that I think realistically, if you were to ask someone who drove, let's say, one of these insanely fast uh, electric cars, do you want it to be faster? They might want it to be lighter. They might want it to handle better. But I don't necessarily think they're going to say, oh, I, yeah, it wasn't quick enough for me. It's like, this is as quick as it gets. And keep in mind, no one mentioned this, that at some level, it's not how fast you can go. Does the car still maneuver at those speeds? Right. Can, can you exactly. Yeah. do things it in it the goes car. 260 miles an hour, but it doesn't turn. It doesn't, doesn't turn. turn. Yeah. You have to have a straight line. And, and the, the only way to stop, the brakes won't work because they're not hard. See, the thing is for me now, is it not then top speed that we is now we are now calling our holy grail for EVs? Is it, I need to. Th I need this thing to go cross country. I need a thousand yeah, plus miles range. out of this. Range, it's range. 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 It's all more about than range. speed. Yeah. I got to tell you, Neil has a very cool uh, electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. And the first time I was in it, he scared the bejesus mm -hmm. out of me. I'm still trying to rub the brown stains off the. Off the <laughs> oh! <laughs> I've never. I'm listen. I ride motorcycles, and oh, yeah. it's the closest thing to a motorcycle acceleration that I've ever experienced. Yeah, in it a was car. there for you. It's just there. It's just, it's you just have it always you need there. It. Yeah, you yeah. Need it. guys, we got to take a quick break. When we come back Ooh. in the third segment, uh, Jason Fenske will tell us what is the future of fuel and energy that's going to drive us. Uh, on the countryside or on the racetrack when Star Talk Sports Edition continues. We're back, Star Talk Sports Edition. This one is up under the hood. <laughs> How do cars work? How do engines work? We've got Jason Fenske from Engineering Explained. Yeah. It's an entire universe, an entire culture he built around his expertise in mechanical engineering and his interest in cars, which is a beautiful place to hang out especially if you're a car geek, as so many people are. So Jason, I wanna just sort of lead off with uh, just a reflection on some, a bit of physics history. So for the longest while we had the steam engine, it was great. And the first automobiles had steam engines in them, all right? Of course mm -hmm. they would, why wouldn't they? Yeah. Uh, before the internal combustion engine was, was perfected by, I guess, Carl Benz. But my point here is, people said, I got an engine, I can convert chemical energy into kinetic energy. Why don't I make an airplane out of this? Okay. So they started trying to design airplanes with steam engines. And they found out that steam engines just weren't powerful enough. So they said, let's build a bigger steam engine. And so they build a bigger steam engine. What are they doing? They're, they're heating coal or wood. It boils water. The water evaporates, creates a steam pressure that drives a turbine or drives whatever it is you need it to drive. The point is that steam engines that were powerful enough to fly an airplane made the airplane too heavy to fly, hmm. period. And it was, it was this weird, frustrating fact. And um, Langley, in fact, has whole books attempting to fly using steam engines. And this didn't work and plan B didn't work. And there he is scratching his head. And it was not until the internal combustion engine, which got a lot of energy in a small volume, could then be uplifted by the Wright brothers into the Wright flyer. And that gave us airplanes. And so I, I'm just fascinated, Jason, when you described the fact that, yeah, if you want to make your electric car go faster, just give it a bigger battery. And yep. at some point I'm saying, that's not going to work. You're no. going to top out. But anyway. No, it's absolutely true. Historical note there. But let, let's continue this. Jason, what's the future of fuel here? What are we talking about? Yeah, so I think, like, let's take this. Um, if you think about airplanes, and you brought up airplanes, and, it, and it's a great point. It is very difficult to have commercial flight today uh, using electric power because energy density is not there. Jet fuel puts a ton of energy into a very small amount of space, not much weight. Uh, electric car batteries are massive, they're super heavy, and they don't have that much energy. To, to give people an idea, um, say, it's, take a modern Tesla with a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack. That's about three gallons of gasoline. 
So this is an object that weighs over a thousand pounds and it has the energy equivalence of about three gallons of gas. In other words, about 20 pounds of gas. Mm -hmm. That's a huge difference, right? Now mm -hmm. electric cars are way more efficient. So there's an advantage there and that when they come, when they, uh, when gasoline combusts, you're at maybe 33% efficiency. Uh, if you're doing well, you know, an electric motor can be at 95% efficiency. So you can triple your efficiency, but you still have to have this giant object. So wait, the wait, challenge just to say that another is, way, is Jason, going to be weight. Just to say that another way. So you have the same energy in an electric battery and in your three gallons of gas. The three gallons yep. of gas, like you said, weighs 20 pounds. The, 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 the battery weighs 1,000 pounds. However, yep. you'll get many more miles out of those 1,000 pounds for the same amount of energy in the battery than you would have out of the gasoline. Yes. Just because of the efficiency yes. of the motor. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Yes, exactly, which is why we don't have three gallon gasoline cars, right? No, there are yeah, there 12, yeah, 15, yeah. 20 <laughs> gallons, so you can actually drive well, a useful distance. Well, uh, motorcycles, how, how big is a motorcycle tank? Three, it's, that's three Yeah, gallons, those are right? small, okay. yeah, yeah, about, yeah, sure. about. Yeah, okay, go on. Mm -hmm. So as far as, as far as, hey, can we solve this airplane problem without using gasoline? Um, there are ways to do it. Hydrogen is one fuel which we can use, and we're experimenting with cars. There's been production cars that use hydrogen, uh, I believe, yeah. actually. Uh, maybe I'm wrong on that statement, but, but hydrogen, no, no, you're yes, right. You're right. The, the hydrogen so fuel, fuel cell, as far as like the Mirai. The, the fuel um, cells. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, Honda Clarity. Uh, and so then from hydrogen, there's also another step you can take because hydrogen itself is not very dense. So if we go back to our analogy of we've got three gallons of gas, We've got, uh, you know, a thousand pounds of battery. One gallon of gasoline stored the way we store hydrogen today, which is like as a high pressure gas, is about, we need about seven gallons of hydrogen. So you still need a lot of space. Hydrogen is very light. That's a good thing, but it takes up a huge amount of space. So, you know, if you have a 10 gallon tank in your car, you now need a 70 gallon tank to go the same distance. So you need a bubble uh, butt, you need a bubble butt on your car. Yeah. Hydrogen is yes. also and very flammable. I was going to say I, isn't yeah. is is the hydrogen going to lead to a, you know, a car that basically you name oh the humanity. No, no, oh, the, yeah. the, the, the humanity. <laughs> the the mm -hmm. Hindenburg. No, no, but yeah. I, but yeah, Jason, hydro, hydrogen is flammable, but so is gasoline. So what what's the trade-off yes. here? Well, the trade-off is that, oh, and it's actually on, this is my, my whiteboard uh, combustion on hydrogen, but as you burn uh, hydrogen with oxygen, your only emissions is water, water. so mm, H2O. Yeah. So that's the big advantage in that you don't have CO2 produced uh, as a byproduct of this combustion product. Um, so yeah, there, there's that's the advantage. And Is, is hydrogen it, more volatile what, than gasoline? I mean, because uh, Neil brings up a great point. They're mm. both combustible. So is yes. is one more volatile? Um, there, there. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, Do you want to test totally it is. in a car? No, 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 no. I'll tell you. No, I can tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. So if you have a a a a a, a basin of gasoline. And you mm. toss in yes. a match, uh, it'll first light the vapors, all right, because there's a lot of gasoline oxygen mixture there. And yeah. then the top of the gasoline will just burn. Whereas if you light a balloon filled with hydrogen, the whole thing explodes instantly. Yes. Oh. Great. Oh. Yeah. By the way, okay. so do you remember Indiana Jones where he's at the Nazi base camp in the desert and he gets yes. into the fight with that with big guy. pugilist guy? Yes. And, mm. and the gasoline spills. Yes. And then it ignites at one end. Right. Well, and then it works its and then way. It works its way all the way through the, the little snake. If that was a line of hydrogen, the whole thing would just explode all at once. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. would have been a terrible scene. Yeah. That <laughs> yeah. yeah you, I, you, another you challenge. <laughs> People, car enthusiasts in particular, like to look at hydrogen as a solution that is not electric cars. Um, and the, the, another big challenge with it, as we're talking about this volatility here, is that you have these tanks and they're at 10,000 PSI. That is what it is stored at in order to get enough hydrogen into a you know small enough space that it becomes useful. Again, we're still- And by the way, in rocket gasoline. launches, we don't. it's not even about the yes. pressure, it's about cooling it. So they cool the hydrogen yes. until it liquefies. Now yes. the liquid hydrogen is way denser than any gaseous hydrogen, yes. even at high pressure, but the, the, the rocket is plugged in to to freezer uh, yes. um, 
uh, elements uh, at elements uh, right until it's ready to launch. So that yes. it's so BMW that's, that's why there was did ice this. falling off of it in Florida. Remember, you see the ice fall off on a launch. That's yeah. why. Yep. That's why this is happening. So, so go on. So BMW actually did this. They had a liquid hydrogen car called the Hydrogen 7 in like 2007. Uh, the challenge is, as it's sitting in your garage, of course, that hydrogen starts to rise in temperature, right? So even though they had this really well insulated uh, fuel tank, eventually you have to let that fuel out. So they said in about 12 days, you can you lose your whole fuel tank. Oh. Which like we don't want that, right? Yeah, that's. By yeah, the way, that's... I remember when they were parading that around, and they gifted me. I think yes. it's actually in my office. I have a a one um, a half liter canister of water, and it says BMW exhaust, and, and from <laughs> when they were parading around that that oh. seven, because that was it was based on their on their Model Seven, I think. What a great uh, marketing team yes, they yes. have. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I mean, <laughs> okay, Jason. We, we've we gone through hydrogen and we're kind of like coming up with a whole load of no's. Yes. As this is. Yes. So there must have, there must be this between situation. Between There's another fossil step. Fuel. Yeah, is it the biofuels? I mean, Formula One racing is going sustainable with its fuels. Really? Think, yes. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, wow. we're looking at 2026, they're going to have all sustainable fuels in their hybrid racing cars. And I think by 2030, they're hoping, he says, that they'll be carbon neutral by 2030. Okay, so, so these will be this. So this will be Formula Two, not Formula One. <laughs> mm. Oh, thank you. So I mean, I mean, with sustainable fuels, are we at this uh, flux capacitor yeah, so, on our DeLorean? So are we, we just going to be putting trash in? We can do it. We, we can. can essentially okay. make gasoline. Um, we can take hydrogen. We can take CO2, we can do some fancy chemistry, and we can mm. create gasoline without ever having taken anything, you know, out from the ground as far as fossil fuels. The challenge is it's very expensive and it takes a lot of energy. Right. So for a, a right. racing series like Formula One, that's no problem, right? They can spend $50 a gallon and they're not going to care. Porsche mm. has said recently that they think their current price per gallon of uh you know a synthetic fuel that's made using these processes it's about 40 dollars a gallon oh, and they want to get it no down problem. to like <laughs> yeah exactly so it's like we can say this and if we can get it cheap um great but you have to think about theoretical limits like right like there is a certain amount of energy required to create that fuel and that will always be greater than if you were to just take that energy and put right. it in a battery and then move the car right so there are processes maybe like airplanes where hey we don't have the capacity to carry all this weight. Maybe we should go the synthetic route, even though it's less efficient from a total energy standpoint. It's green, so that's great. We didn't have, you know, net emissions from it. Uh, but right. for just, things just like a, cars, it's very at challenging. Of, at the risk of stating the obvious, the the oil in the ground is, other than the cost to extract it, is basically free it's energy. Free. Nature yes. sitting there. Nature mm. made that energy density in the oil. Right? right, and you take it out and it's ready to use. So, uh, I, so interesting you say that, Jason, that we have the ability to just basically make gasoline, but it, it takes more energy than the energy you'd get out of the gasoline you made. Mm -hmm. So it would have well, to be for very sure purposes. The sun made that oil, but the sun is also available to us at all times. And I think the real uh, um, a path forward is batteries and solar together so mm. you know some 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 means of sustaining and increasing the the gain of a battery than yes. you know than burning something this public service announcement it, brought to you by chuck nice thank so, you you, okay, know so, I feel, you know how i feel about uh, fossil fuels we I all know, know how i feel uh, about fossil fuels before we get to chuck's solution th there's ethanol e-fuels i mean yeah, what uh, about all that? What about all that? Yeah, so and, where are and, where, where are corn? we with using them? Because they're used in Formula One and in IndyCar, but they use different uh, e fuels. One is an E10, one is an E85. So yes. what are what are the you know? Does this produce Chanel Number no. Five as a byproduct <laughs> or water so, or what does it so do? These are these are challenging because if you if you look at what the people who make it say, mm. you know, one perspective. They say this is 60% of the emissions, uh, talking about ethanol coming from corn here, this right. is 60% of the emissions as gasoline. So it's still a significant amount, though a significant savings, you know, according to the best case of the industry that creates it. If you look at studies that have been done on what are the actual emissions, some say it's equal, if not higher, than gasoline. 
And and so there's this spectrum of, okay, maybe at best we do what? A 40% improvement using corn-based ethanol. There are better solutions. You don't have to use corn. You can use all yeah, kinds of different say, crops. Sugar, sugar, is, a, sugar is much mm. better than corn anyway, but yes, there's all kinds exactly. of lobbying issues there because America makes corn. We don't make sugar. Yes. Yes, exactly. So we're starting from a problematic point because we've decided mm. corn must be the way America does it. And unfortunately, it's not the best way to do it. Uh, the emissions will always be greater than other solutions. All right, we got to land this plane or oh, before uh, park we this do, car. Neil, before but, we do, l l there's something that's kind of an uh, itch I need to scratch here. We talk about batteries. We talk about how we're going to make them lighter, how they can store more, how they can do this, how we can weigh less, etc. But what are we doing with disposal? Because these things are packed full of rare earth minerals, right? And we're going to just tip them into a landfill site and walk away because we're solving one problem while we create another. So where are we going forward with this? Sorry to sort of delay. You sound like you're blaming good... Jason for it, man. No, 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 no. I, I, <laughs> like I said, right. this is a curiosity I have. Yeah, you know, Jason. Got... What's, Jason. What's up, man? What's up with you? Know, what's I mean, your problem, bro? <laughs> All right. If, if you've got a like connecting fly. poison into soil. Yeah, yeah, so if you've yeah. got a yeah, connecting no, I think, flight, I'm sorry, but we're circling the airport now before this baby lands. Go. So what's what's No, I think I think it's a great point and I feel like it should be discussed more. And I feel like it's mm. one of those things where it's just like, oh, like we can ignore that, uh, because EV is so new and we don't have uh, an insane quantity of dead EV battery packs just sitting there useless, right? right? Um I don't I don't know from a chemistry standpoint if there are super hard changes that occur within the battery, but to the best of my knowledge. The, all the elements are still in there, right? Yeah, so I think so. It's, it's That's fair. Currently, mostly a matter of cost. Uh, is is it worth doing? And we like to historically do things based purely on cost and disregard any other factors. And you can put shift the cost to the environment and say, well, the environment got screwed, but I saved a dollar. So I I would prefer to see that we do this the right way, right? And we recycle all of these. Uh, and I don't think again, it's it's that easy to just throw your electric car battery yeah, in the trash. I, I was going to say, just pick it up. As this scales, I think what we'll see is that battery collection and battery recycling becomes a business and an industry in itself. Yes. And okay. when the profit yes. presents itself in that industry, those problems will almost take care of themselves because somebody will be making money, even if it is the yeah. actual battery company manufacturers. But somebody, whether it's a secondary go. market or the battery manufacturers themselves or the end user in terms of recouping costs, somebody's going to make money somewhere. And that's where you'll see incentives. Yes. Because uh, Chuck you can Nice think for of that city, battery. city Council. Chuck Nice is running for City Council. <laughs> okay. Well, you can think of that battery as like a concentrated solution of all the elements you need to make batteries. So from that standpoint, it's like, this is very valuable. It has all the stuff that I want. And there are small companies today that are doing this process and trying to split the minerals and then reselling them. And one other point that was left un unnoted, that we, we seem to forget that the act of making an electric car does itself have a carbon footprint so true. and that's not often folded into what it is people say they're saving for having so done true. so, so yeah true. i yep. we gotta we, we gotta end it there jason oh, it's man. been a delight to have you yeah. on good this stuff. thank you for having me hey jason thank jason really and appreciate it we we can't make this the end of our conversations about this because cars are endlessly Perfect. fascinating the past present and future and that's where your 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 head is up under the hood if not in the hood, and that's good enough for us. <laughs> All right. Thank you so, so much. Really appreciate y'all having me. You got it. All right, Chuck, Gary, we got to call it quits there. Always so, a pleasure. Neil yeah. deGrasse Tyson here for a Star Talk Sports Edition. This one was up under the hood, how cars work, basically, uh, with our special guest, Jason Fenske. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. Keep looking up. <laughs>